You were about 17 when your dad got sentenced to 50 years in yeah. jail. She was kind of like the John Gotti of his day. Very high profile, always under investigation, always a major target of law enforcement. So I grew up with that. When my dad was ready to propose me, he said, I got to ask you one question, son. If you ever had to kill anybody, could you do it? Under the right conditions, dad, yeah, I can do it. He said, that's the right answer. There were certain things I did in that life that I was very uncomfortable with. Quite honestly, I kind of stepped outside of myself. Hey, I've got an order. This has got to be done. Boom. There were six of us the night I got made. Five of them were murdered. We were told straight out, you deal with drugs, you die. You become an informant, you pay with your life. Your best friend walks you into a room, you don't walk out again. He would bring guys in there and actually murder them, chop up their bodies and, and dispose of them. As a matter of fact, one of the guys responsible for that is getting out of prison fairly soon. We didn't uh, obey the law. We didn't care about that. You know, we would do whatever we had to do. We were bringing in six, seven, eight, ten million dollars a week, you know. But they said to me, look, you you're either going to cooperate with us because he's implicated other guys or we're going to indict you for what this guy is saying. I said, take your best shot. I told him, right? <laughs> then they had me in lockdown for 29 months and seven days in solitary. You want to get out of here? You know, just talk to us. Leave me alone. Welcome back to the True Geordie podcast. Everyone who knows me knows I love anything mafia related, all the gangster movies. I'm addicted and I'm so lucky to say we have got one of the real deals in the studio today. It's Michael Francis. You got it. Thank you for coming, mate. Good to be here. All the way from America. Um, you're going to be doing a tour. March 15th starts in London. Yes. Excited for that. And you're going to be around for a while. So there's loads of opportunities for people to, to come and see you, right? Yeah, three-week tour, Brian, yeah. and, and the reason I came back, I was here um, not this, this summer, but the summer before, mm. and it was such a great tour. People were wonderful. I didn't realize how into the mob stuff they are here in the UK, Obsessed. but uh, we had, I think, 15 dates, and uh, it was great. You know, I met so many people and uh, just was excited to come back, so I think we're at three weeks, uh, probably 12 cities. And uh, very excited, so can't wait. Yeah, well, people people have to go and check you out because I've been obsessed with your YouTube channel for years now. And I want to give a little bit of background for people who may not be familiar with you because by the age of 35, Fortune magazine listed Francis as number 18 on its list of 50 most, most wealthy and powerful mafia bosses and apparently generating up to $8 million a week. It was a life of crime for 20, 20 years on the street, arrested 18 times, eight years in prison, um, even name-checked in the Goodfellas movie, which was where a lot of people will have heard your name before without realizing it. Goodfellas is a movie that I am, I've just watched a million times. What was it like for you to be named in that movie? Well, you know, I was kind of shocked. I had just gotten out of prison, and so I took my wife to see the movie. And, you know, she's not into all of the mob stuff. She lived through it, so... Uh, I had to almost drag her to the movie, you know. So it was funny, Brian. The way it opens up, it's pretty graphic. You know, oh, yeah. You're stabbing him in the car and all that. <laughs> so my wife turned to me and she said, is this what your life was really all about? And I said, come on, honey, it's a movie. They make things up. Don't, don't worry about it. No sooner I say that than they have the bar scene and there's Michael Francis. So she looks at me and I said, come on, let's go. We left, right? Whoa. Because I'm saying this was a different family. But I knew Henry Hill very well. I knew Jimmy Burke very well. So the writer, Nick Pileggi, he put me in there. He said, Michael, you had name value. You know, we wanted to put you in the film. So it was kind of a, you know, I didn't expect it. But, um, you know, it's uh, so many people have mentioned that now because the film was, you know, one of the best films ever in that life, really. And you're named in a scene that is iconic in that right yes. before the, how am I funny? And all, all yes, of that bit. Yes, yes. So it's a bit that everyone always wants to rewatch. Yes. And uh, you mentioned Henry Hill. Obviously, it is a dramatized version of reality. Mm -hmm. How far away from reality was that movie, in your opinion? Well, the movie was pretty realistic as far as the characters, the way they were depicted. The story was pretty well on tap. But, you know, and I, I teased Henry about this. Henry never looked so good as he did in that movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was you know, a handsome man playing him. Yes. Yeah. And they, they made him a lot more important, really, than he was in that life. Because he was there. He wasn't a made guy, obviously, because mm -hmm. his, his dad was uh, was an Italian. But... You know, Henry had some issues. I mean, he had a drug issue, had an alcohol issue, so he wasn't that prominent in the life. But, uh, you know, hey, it was a great movie. They did a good job, and, you know. I actually seen a video of Henry as an older man going back around the old neighborhood and even still being very uh, yes. frightened, you know, in his older age even. 
Well, let me tell you what happened. I'm in uh, Terminal Island Prison. I'm doing my time. And I was in there for a couple of years. And I, I walk out into the yard, and we just got out of the chow hall. And I see a guy, and I kind of recognize him. I didn't realize it was Henry because he had, he had really aged, right? Mm. So I go back to my cell, and the lieutenant calls me into the office. And he says to me, Michael, uh, did you notice somebody in the yard? And I said, no, nah, what are you talking about? And he's, come on, Michael. It was Henry, and Henry at that time was on separation from all of us because, you know, he had cooperated and all that. And he looked at me and he said, you know, Henry just PC'd up. He put himself in protective custody because he saw you and, you know, he's in trouble. I said, he's got nothing to worry about with me. So we're going to have to ship you out. They were going to ship me out. I said, hey, I've been here for a couple of years. It's close to my, ship him out, right? So finally they did. But uh, that was kind of the last encounter I had with him. Wow. Yeah. And in terms of like, you know, the entertainment side of things, the depictions that we've seen so many times, is there a, a movie or a TV show, maybe Sopranos or a movie, that you look at and you go, you know, that's the closest thing they got to the real life? Yeah. Well, a couple. You know, the uh, this was the 1996 HBO movie, movie called Gotti, and it was Ar Armand Asante and Anthony Quinn. Mm. Brilliantly done. I mean, Armand Asante played Gotti so well. Anthony Quinn, there was a scene in there that gave me the chills that mm. Anthony Quinn did it so well. And it was pretty accurate because they did it right according to the surveillance tapes and, the, and that they had on him. So uh, that's, that's my number one as far as authenticity. Mm. If you go to uh, Donnie Brasco, I thought that was uh, Al Pacino's best role. I knew Angela, uh, uh, Lefty really well. He played him so well. Uh, you know, and then listen, Casino was great. You know, it was a good movie. Uh, obviously, Goodfellas. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of good ones out there. And when you get Scorsese and that crew together, they can't make a bad movie. I mean, they're terrific. Can you remember your first sort of realization of what this was when you were a child, like being understanding of mafia? Well, you know, Brian, my dad uh, was such a high profile figure back in the late 50s and 60s. He was kind of like the John Gotti of his day. Very high profile, always under investigation, always a major target of law enforcement. So I grew up with that. My dad was constantly being arrested, charged with, you know, criminal activity, went to trial three times. We had agents around us all the time surveilling us. So even though my dad didn't discuss it in the house, I mean, he had so much media and everything, I kind of knew what was going on, even at a young age. But, you know, the real eye-opening thing that happened with me, Joe Colombo, who was the boss of the Colombo family, my dad had gone to prison, and we were at a, uh, an Italian-American Civil Rights League rally at Columbus Circle in New York. And, uh, you know, he had put this whole league together because he said Italians were being, you know, harassed by the FBI. And it was that day uh, I was up on a stage with him. He had called me over to hand me some brochures that he wanted me to hand out about the league. And I walked 12 steps away from him, and that's when he got shot. It was an attempted assassination. He got shot. He eventually died from the wounds. He was in a coma from that point. But that, that made me realize, hey, this is the real thing. It was the first time I had witnessed something like that. So can you give us a, an idea of what the Colombo family was like and, and, and what kind of characters were in there and what the status of that family was in New York? Well, you know, I always say that the golden years of the mob in America, of course, in Western America, really from the, uh, the late 40s right through to the mid 80s. So I was in that era because obviously my dad throughout the 60s, I, uh, I really got involved in the life in 1970 when my dad went to prison. And I became a maid member in 1975. So I was in the midst of what I call the golden years. And uh, the Colombo, there's five families in New York. And the Colombo family is one of the smaller ones. We, were, we had about 115 maid guys. We had a lot of associates, but guys that actually took the oath. And um, I mean, look, it was a real deal. I mean, you know, that's, that's, it was during a time in New York, where we had a lot of power and a lot of control. We controlled all the unions. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of political power and we had a lot of power on the street, you know? So I was in the midst of all of that. And that was a time when, you know, Joe Colombo, Carmine Persico, who was my boss, uh, Fat Tony Salerno, the boss of the Genovese, I mean, Paul Castellano, John Gotti, that was the era. So, I mean, I, you know, I knew all of those guys. And I think from what I read up, you were about 17 when your dad got sentenced to 50 years in yeah. jail. Now, 
even if we remove the mafia element of it, that's a hell of a blow to a young man to probably lose what was probably his hero at that age. Yeah. Could you just describe what that was like for you? It was tough because my dad was, he was 50 years old when he went in mm. and he got a 50 year sentence. I figured, hey, you're going to die in prison, you know? Uh, and it was a blow because my dad was my idol. He was my hero growing up. And to have that loss like that was was very, very tough. But, you know, and, and I say this, Brian, my dad obviously did a lot of bad things in that life. So did I, you know, during my time. But that particular crime that my dad did all that time for, he did 40 years on the 50. Uh, he was innocent of. He was 100% framed. I investigated that case thoroughly. We spoke to every witness that testified against him. They all recanted their testimony. We gave them lie detector tests, proved they lied at the trial. And the FBI was complicit in that with him. So as a result of that, I had a real hatred for government because, hey, they framed my father, took him away, destroyed my family, the whole bit. So it was really a blow. And, you know, prior to that, my dad didn't want me involved in the life. He wanted me to go to school, be a professional, be a doctor. And it wasn't until that he went to prison that my life changed and I got out on the street basically to help him out because without that, he's going to die in jail. So, I mean, it was a life-changing experience for me. It was it was bank robbing that they framed him for. Is that right? He was supposedly masterminded a nationwide string of bank robbers. He gave the order to the, to the bank robbers. And, uh, you know, it's just a bad case. We can never get it overturned, can never get the conviction overturned. Did you ever want him to snitch and like just to get him back? Did you ever wish that he would when you were young? I, I didn't understand that concept back then, oh. you know, but no, but you know, what really, it, what got me with him is my dad was out on parole five times and he kept getting violated for association with other criminals. You're not allowed to do that when you're on federal parole. And like his third time, I started to get upset with him. I said, Dad, our family's falling apart. You got to get away from these guys. You know, you, you, you can't make it here in New York. You're too high profile a figure. But, you know, that was his life. And, uh, you know, as a result, he, he stayed in it and just kept going back to jail. I don't know if this is the same way for you, but obviously in my life, sometimes I feel like I've become my dad's dad. Like, uh, how did your uh, you know relationship with him evolve over the course of that time as he's in prison aging and you're now sort of rising to power outside of jail? Well, yeah, it was kind of maybe a little uncomfortable because, you know, I become a soldier in 1975, 1980. I was elevated to the position of captain. And he was a captain when he got out. So we were both equal ranks at that point. Wow. But he really couldn't do anything because of his parole situation. And I was doing everything, you know. So it made me a little bit uncomfortable because I always looked up to my dad as being, you know, up there. And then we we're kind of equal in that life, even though I gave him all the respect because, you know, he, he deserved that. You know, he was kind of a, you know, a stalwart in that life. Mm -hmm. But it changed a bit because... You know, and this is hard to say, Brian, but, you know, I always looked up to my dad as being this invincible guy. And when he came home, it wasn't the same. Yeah. You know, I expected him like to come out and we're going to take over the family and all of that. But it, it didn't happen that way. So I was a little disappointed. I think I put a little too much pressure on him in that regard, you know. Um, you know, there was a point in time, you know, I, I can share this, when our boss, Carmine Persico, he broke my father, meaning he took my father's captaincy away. So my father's a soldier and I'm a captain. You know, I'm higher in rank. I was very upset about that. I said, Dad, how can they do this to you? You know, you got 50 years. You never opened your mouth. You never said anything. And it was very disappointing to me to the fact where I wanted to go to war with people. I was that mad, you know. Wow. But he said, no, you know, abide your time. And they used it as an excuse. They said, you know, you're always getting violated, so we're going to take you out of everything so that, you know, you don't have to be part of it. You just stay there and let your son do everything. But I took it as a real slap in the face. He was smarter. He said, just let it go. Don't worry about it. That's how this life is. But it was very disappointing to me. You were standing on his shoulders, essentially, to become the person you became. So now to see the man who started it all be disrespected, it must have, yeah, like invoked that emotional reaction in you. And from what I understand, part of the reason, it could be wrong, but part of the reason they wanted to make you earlier than what would normally happen is kind of as an ode of respect to your old man yes. who, who did the right thing in their eyes and didn't rat on his friends and all of that. So... Yeah, to then take his captaincy away. Yeah. It's a backhanded thing, right? It, it was. And yeah, they gave him the courtesy because, you know, 
When I got made, there was a uh, uh, an expression that the books were closed from the mm. 50s right into the mid-70s, meaning they weren't bringing any new guys into the family. The only way you could do that, and this was all five families, if somebody died, you were able to replace them. Wow. So now in 1975, when I got made, there was a ton of guys that were waiting 20 years to become made. And I got moved up to the front as a courtesy for my dad. I mean, I still had to prove myself, you know, two and a half years, but they moved me up in front of a lot of guys. So some guys were resentful of that, but my dad deserved that respect because he needed me on the street. I had to try to get him out of prison. He needed me there. So he asked for that and they did it. Uh, And then, yeah, you know, later on to kind of be disrespectful in that regard, because they could have said to him, look, you're still a captain. Just stay away from everything. Don't get violated again. But to take that away from him was was tough. I can only assume from their point of view that, like, if we do him this favor, he's more likely to keep his mouth shut and, like, we're all in this together still sort of thing. I mean, look, my father could have buried a lot of guys, no question about it. And he wouldn't... You'd have to kill him first. He wouldn't have even thought of that. He was a, he was the most stand-up guy in that life that you ever want to meet, no doubt. I can see how much pride that gives you when you talk about him in a lot of your interviews. And I, you know, I've seen the, the sit-down with Sammy uh, Gravano, yeah. and he's challenging you. And, and I feel like a lot of where your self-worth comes from is like, this guy built me, and he you can't question that. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I, I, it, it's admirable that he was like that, you know what I mean? Despite obviously being a criminal, I guess yes. there was a certain code there that in the today's criminals that we've got all over London pulling knives on these innocent little kids out here, mm. they don't have that. Do you ever look at modern criminals with a sense of like disgust? You know, I do because I, I just can't understand the mentality. You know, look, I never glorify my former life, you know, because I always say it's a bad life because families get destroyed as a result of membership in Mm -hmm. that life. My family was destroyed, you know, and I I tried to preserve my family. When I say my family, I mean mother, father, brother, sister, destroyed. But my family, I preserved them from that. But, you know, when I look at these guys today, I mean, I, I, I just don't understand. You know, there's no, we had a certain honor and a certain respect about us. We took care of our communities, our neighborhoods. There was no crime in our neighborhood, none whatsoever. You know, we took care of the people. That's why even, you know, a lot of guys said, hey, you know, why was John Gotti so loved? He was loved in his neighborhood like my father was, like I was, because we took care of people. We didn't hurt people where we were. You don't see that today. You know, people I don't know how it is. are of these young kids now. Oh, yeah. In the United States, I can't believe what's going on there. Yeah. I mean, they're just wild animals. Mm. I mean, it's, it's crazy, really. Yeah, I mean, crime is is never great, but like, again, not glorifying what your life was, but equally, it certainly deserved more respect than today's, you know, young uh, criminals who are out here just stabbing people just to prove they can do it. Yeah. I mean, that, and that that's happening a lot right now in the UK and London, especially. Um, and in terms of being made, can you describe that process of what it really means and, and what you do and who you're with and that sort of thing? Well, when I was proposed, my dad proposed me for membership. You know, in that life, you can't go up to somebody and say, hey, I'd like to join. (laughs) Somebody has to propose you, vouch for you, say you had what it takes. In my case, it was my dad. So um, after Joe Colombo was shot and seriously wounded, a new boss took over. His name was Tom DeBella. And I sat with Tom after my dad sent word from prison. And he said to me, Mike, um, I got a message from your father. You want to become a member of our life? Yes. From now on, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you're on call to serve this family, the Colombo family. That means if your mother is sick and dying, you're at her bedside. We call you to service. You leave your mother. You come and serve us. We're number one in your life before anything and everything. When and if we feel you deserve this honor, this privilege to become a member, we'll let you know. From that point on, you're in a recruit period. You got to do anything and everything you're told to do to prove yourself worthy. And, you know, Brian, I I hate to be offensive to anybody, but I got to be honest, you know, when my dad was ready to propose me, he said, I got to ask you one question, son. I said, what's that? He said, if you ever had to kill anybody, could you do it? And, you know, kind of a question you don't expect, but I thought about it for a minute and I said, under the right conditions, dad, yeah, I can do it. He said, that's the right answer. And that's all he needed to hear from me because he knew me, you know, obviously. And, um, you know, look, the life is violent at times. There's no way to get away from it. You know, if you're part of the life, you're part of the violence. We keep it within ourselves, but that's the way it is. 
And uh, and then you had to obey orders, you know? There's a lot of discipline in that life. You had a meeting at 8 o'clock. You weren't there at 7.30. You were late. You can never be late. No excuse. I don't care if there's accidents, if there's an earthquake. You got to be on time, period. You know, go there the night before if you have to. But, uh, you know, drive the boss to a meeting, sit in a car three, four, five hours. You know, you leave to go to the bathroom or, or, or get a newspaper. He comes out. You're not there. You're in trouble. I did that once. I know. <laughs> a lot of stuff like that. You know, you're on call to do whatever you're told to do. And you got to prove yourself worthy. And if and when you do, then you get the privilege uh, of being made. You know, without admitting too much, uh, you were asked to do a lot of things. And, and there was there was guys, um, from what I understand in your story, the guys you were made with were murdered as well. All five of them. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. There were six of us the night I got made. Five of them were murdered. That shocked me because in all the movies, there's this idea of if you're a made guy, you can't be touched. Uh, that is the theory behind it. But obviously, obviously it doesn't always work that way. No, Brian, you have certain rules. And if you break the rules, you know you could pay with your life. You're mm. told straight out. Don't ever violate another man's, you know, wife, daughter, sister, mother. Mm -hmm. That's death. At that time, and I know I get a lot of controversy about this, you know, we were not allowed to deal with drugs. Mm -hmm. We were told straight out, you deal with drugs, you die. And I knew people that made that mistake, mm -hmm. you know. You become an informant, you pay with your life, you know. So there's a lot of things like that, you know. So you know how you look at it. And I don't, I'm not justifying, but hey, we all took the same oath. We all understand this is what we're not supposed to do. And if we do it, we're going to pay the consequences. Mm -hmm. So you almost feel justified. Well, he broke the rules. He knew better, uh -huh. you know, but again, you keep it within, you know, a lot of people think that when you take the oath of Omerta, that it's an oath to lie, steal, cheat, kill. It's not. The oath of Omerta means silence. You're never even supposed to admit that the life exists. That's what you take. Obviously, as a part of that life, you know, we didn't, we didn't uh, obey the law. We didn't care about that. You know, we would do whatever we had to do. But, um, and, and, you know, I have to say this, you know, for your audience, murder was not a first action. It was always a last resort, you know, and in our life it was very serious. Only the boss can okay it. You know, if something had to go down, the boss would would give the final word on that. And then whatever happened, happened from that point. But I think a lot of people get the impression, especially from movies, we just went around killing people <laughs> every day, like some of these young kids today. Yeah. Not the truth, at least not through my experience. One thing that really hit me about your dad's story, just before we move on from him, was that your own brother testified against him. And knowing the way you are about your dad, I could only imagine that must have been quite heartbreaking. It, it was it was shocking, quite honestly. Even though my brother had a severe drug problem, uh, but we never expected it to go to that level. Um, yeah, and I was I was at the trial when my brother was testifying. It was like, is this really happening? You know. Uh, but you know, Brian, honestly, too. And my brother was in the witness protection program, so like 10 years, I didn't see him after that. I had a 70th birthday two years ago, and my wife invited him and because he was out of the program, and I was like stunned when I seen him. You know, he showed up. I didn't know. It was a surprise for me. But, you know, I got to be honest, Brian. My brother sat down with me, and he he said, I don't know if you understand the torture that we went through as a family. And, you know, look, I had a sister died of an overdose of drugs. My younger sister, 41 years old, she was never mentally stable. She passed away at 41. My mother dies 33 years without her husband. Our life at the end was a mess. And then my brother's did drugs, testified. It's destructive to the family. Mm -hmm. So he started telling me some of the emotion that he felt as a kid growing up and some of the resentment he had for my dad. And... I I almost understood because it kind of opened my eyes. For some reason, I kind of survived all of that where my brothers and sisters didn't. But hearing it from his perspective, I said, you know, I never thought of things this way, you know, and the, the kid went through a lot. He really did. And uh, it, it's heartbreaking. It really is. 
And now, a word from our sponsors. This podcast is brought to you by FlexiSpot. FlexiSpot make the next generation of desks so that you can have the best setup, but also the most comfortable. Now, the one I've got is the A7 Pro, and the reason for this is that standing up is much better for you than sitting down all day hunched over while you're working. And how does it work? Well, it's very easy. On the little keypad, you can program up to four preset heights at the touch of a button. And this one goes from 63.5 centimeters all the way up to 128.5 centimeters so even if you're a tall bloke like me you can still feel very comfortable while you're working oh and the keypad actually comes with a built-in usb charge out which is very handy and for the people out there who tend to have a lot of work on their desks or even the gamers who want to have a full gaming setup this is perfect because it supports a whopping 160 kilograms of weight this is built better than the titanic and actually if jack and rose had had this desk in the water with them they'd both be alive to tell the tale and i've gone for a big work space here so i've got 160 by 80 centimeters bamboo top everything is fully customizable in terms of size and material and also the legs come in different colors as well and one of the best bits about it is it comes with a cable management slot which keeps everything organized and tidy under the desk so if you want the best desk setup possible then you've got to check out flexi spot just click my link in the description below they've also got chairs and storage to complete your setup to make it perfect just for you so thanks to flexi spot but for now enjoy the video yeah you're quite a stoic person who probably i mean there's a reason you're still here to tell the tale right like you are made of tough stuff and i think i watched one interview where you mentioned uh you mentioned your mother there about how you thought that they might have based tony soprano's mother <laughs> on the wiretaps or something that they had in your house yeah on your mother which kind of made me laugh because tony soprano's mother was the greatest character in that she show <laughs> so i thought what must your mother have been like she must have been such a character uh, my mother was extremely into, she was she was my father's match mm. no doubt about it very independent um you know she she was rough to get along with mm -hmm. rough to get along with and uh so there was always a lot of turbulence in the house the mom and daddy it was it was very very tough but somehow i survived it mm. i don't know and the rest of them didn't and it really affected them. And I, and I kind of understood, you know, and now my brother and I are close again. And I get knocked from, oh, your brother was a rat, you're this and that. And, you know, you, and I say, hey, don't, it's my family, you know, don't tell me what to do. But I really understand in a way where he's coming. I don't agree with it. Don't get me wrong. You know, I don't agree with what he did, but I understand. Yeah, forgiveness is a is a thing that I, I mean, getting older myself now, I'm finding it's coming easier and easier. Whereas when I was younger, I'd hold a grudge. Yes. Um, and I think it's good for you in your older years now to be able to like let things go a bit. You know, I found that holding a grudge and, uh, you know, being resentful is, is a burden to yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can let it go and uh, and accept things that happened in the past, like, you know, a lot of guys on my on my social media platform, oh, you know, your friends with Sammy Gravano and Sammy and I, we butt, butted heads. I think you saw. Yeah, I've seen. You know? And that was real, by the way. It was real. Oh, yeah. But we kind of patched it up afterwards. I said, look, Sammy, whatever you did, you know, whatever I did, we did. That was our past. And there's no sense in taking that, you know, at, at this point in time in our lives. And I kind of look at it that with everybody, you know, I mean, why, why not? Why was Sammy so sort of hostile towards you? You know, Sammy's a different character, you know, um, and I got to like him uh, a lot. And I like his family. His, you know, I interviewed his, uh, his daughter, Karen, was one of the best interviews ever. She was so honest. So I related to her feelings with her dad, me, with my, and his son, uh, uh, Gerard, you know, nice people. Mm -hmm. So, and I look at that, you know, you raise great kids, you know, as far as I'm concerned. But, you know, he was hostile in, in the beginning because he's the one that brought it out. Oh, you jumped ahead of everybody when you got made and guys were resentful. I said, hey, what do you want from me? I didn't make that decision. They made that decision. You know, don't worry about it. But, you know, we butted heads. But then I don't know what was on his mind at that point. I felt like watching that interview, and I, I'll give you my opinion, see what you make of it. He really... The identity of him being like that bad, the bad man, you know, the killer, you know, to then have to be called a rat by so many people because of the way it ended for him. And, and listening to the story about him and how people were ratting on him. So it was kind of rat or be ratted on, like really. But I feel like that really bothers him. And the fact that you also gave up some information, mm -hmm. but weren't giving up people right. made him feel like, 
Oh, but you're not better than me, though. And there was this in, um, what's that word? Uh, word? He, he felt a bit like, oh, I feel like, uh, what's the word? Maybe inferior in some way, shape or form. And he, he had that like complex about, well, it doesn't make you any better because we both gave up information. So therefore we're both about as bad as each other. And I felt like he was constantly trying to push you into that. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think that was part of it, you know, because look, even though you did something like that, you don't want to be known to be a bad guy. Mm. And I understand that. I totally do. So I, and, and I got it afterwards, you know, um, and I think, you know, a lot of the guys that were in that position that, you know, cooperated and went into the program and, and testified and things like that, I think they don't feel good about it. None of them do, you know, and whatever the circumstance, whatever the reason was that pushed them into that, you know, I don't want to pass judgment on that. But I think that was part of it. But after we got past that, you know, and I said, Sammy, I'm not judging you. You're not judging me, whatever. It, it is what it is. Yeah. And then we, we put it to rest. It's, fa it's fascinating that these, like a guy who's, done the things he's done can now just be a YouTuber. Yeah. Like that's so bizarre to me. All of us, yeah. you know, I mean, whoever thought we'd be on YouTube. I mean, yeah. when I sit and think about it at times, I said, this, it's crazy. <laughs> it really is. Okay. So the thing that you are really well known for is being a great earner. And if there's one thing I've noticed from all of this, uh, you know, mafia movies, it's if you're a good earner, People are going to like you, uh, but you were around killer. So like, how did you, you know, they're probably jealous of you being in the good books with the boss, giving them all that money. How did you navigate that whole situation and how did you amass so much money? Well, you know, it, it's true because I was one of the younger guys too. And you have resentment from, you know, just like everyday life, you know, mm -hmm. the older guys, they kind of have resentment for the younger guys. You have to navigate that course in, in that life because it could be, you know, things are more intense in that life, you know, and, and maybe you lose a position in, in real life. In that life, you could lose your life. You know, you got to be careful who you rub the wrong way. Um, do you have you to know, stay humble a lot? Like, you do. Not because if you're giving it cockiness, exactly, these guys aren't going to like you at all. Exactly. Yeah. And you have to give deference to the older guys just because they've been there longer. And that's it, you know, and then spread the wealth, you know, listen, in that life, money talks. You know, and uh, you, you kind of separate yourself in that life. You have the racketeers, which are the guys that bring in the money. Mm -hmm. And then you have the gangsters that do a lot of the work, you know. And I always say this, a gangster normally can't be a, a racketeer because they don't know how to use the life to earn, you know. But a racketeer has to be a gangster and a racketeer because if you're called upon to do something, you got to do it. And um, I kind of separated myself as a guy that knew how to earn. I mean, I knew how to use that life to benefit me in business and went on to make a lot of money. And when you do that, you rise in the ranks. You know, my boss was very appreciative of that. I made him a lot of money. And, uh, but the other thing is people want to be around you when you're an earner. So if you navigate that properly and let people earn, the people that are supposed to be earning with you, uh, then you do okay, you know? But you also have to know, listen, there's there's always a point where even the older guys, they can't push you because you're equal. You're all equal. You know, you're told when you become a made guy, we're all equal. Everybody's the same. So you only give deference to a certain point. But at some point, hey, you know, enough. And you got to put people in their place. And that happened to me quite a bit. But, um, you know, fortunately, I was able, I, I can say this, Brian, I didn't make a lot of enemies. If I had enemies, it was just resentment because of who I was and I was younger. But I didn't make enemies. I didn't go out there to make enemies. You know, I always, I always live by this. The best way to uh, defeat your enemies is to make them your friends. And I, I have that same thing now. You know, a lot of guys take knocks at me on YouTube and I never respond to them. And the guys that were knocking me, who I never even met, I didn't even know who they were, you know, uh, but YouTube, that's how people start on their platform. Now they're all coming to me and we're friends because I said to them, if you'd asked me maybe to come on your show or do this, I would have came. You didn't have to start knocking me, you know, and all of that. We can help each other. We're not competing here. YouTube's, yeah, YouTube's a big platform. There's room for everybody, you know. But I understand. I understand. I don't hold it against anybody. But, you know, now we're all friends. It's a, it's a better way to be. You, you, had, you kind of had to be a politician back then as well, like to, to know how oh, to yeah. play everyone. And I, I guess that old saying is keep your friends close, keep your enemies close. Absolutely. And another saying that I've come up with lately, uh, which is not everyone, um, something along the lines of some people who are your friends are only your friends because they haven't got the balls to be your enemy. 
Absolutely. And, and uh, you know, the older I get, the more I realize that. And, and from from what I researched, one of your biggest money makers was the gasoline business. So can you kind of break down how you managed to use uh, your brains to, to think of getting all that money out of it? Well, you know, as a guy that came to me that was in the gas business, had a small operation, and he had the germ of an idea of taking, defrauding the government out of tax on every gallon of gasoline. And he came to me with this idea, and we were able to expand it. I was able to help him and expand it into a very major operation. When I say major, we had uh, we ran it for about eight years, and I had over three hundred uh, about three hundred and fifty gas stations, three twenty five, three fifty. I either owned or operated. We leased, so we were supplying all of them. And then I had eighteen companies that were licensed to collect the tax on every gallon of gasoline. And then we devised a way to collect it and not pay it. I mean, the scheme was simple. The operation was complex because we had to hold the government off from coming down on us, you know. And I would get about a year out of every license before the government would come down on us. And then we would just destroy that and move on to the next company. So we just kept doing it. It was a daisy chain. And they couldn't figure it out. So to give you an idea of the numbers, at the height of my operation, we were selling a half a billion gallons of gas a month, taking down 20, 30, 40 cents a gallon, whatever the market, whatever deal we made at the time. So we were bringing in six, seven, eight, ten million dollars a week, you know, on average. So it was, it was, I, I would say this, and I think it's hard to dispute, that was probably the biggest money making deal since the days of prohibition, other than drugs. Mm. But we weren't big in the drug business. The mafia in Italy, big drug dealers. We weren't big in the United States. So this was probably the biggest operation since Prohibition. Yeah, apparently you were second only to Al Capone in terms of money generated. Well, that's what the media said. I don't I don't want to say yes to that, but who knows? Well, it's a pretty cool uh, title to have. <laughs> uh, and the drug thing is quite interesting because in all the movies, it, they, they reiterate that as well. Like, you know, you stay away from drugs because drugs are the kind of sentences that will make people break. And have you ever tried drugs? I've never even smoked a joint in my life. I'm going to be really honest. I well, took one, uh, I was like 20 years old. I was with some girl and she gave me a half of a Quaalude. Oh, okay. A half. And I said, after that, I'm never going <laughs> to. <laughs> Wolf of Wall Street. I'm never again. And that, that was the end of that. But uh, I hate anything to do with drugs, Brian, mm -hmm. because I saw how destructive it was in my own family. So yeah. never smoked a joint. Never, I mean, a prescription if I'm given one. Fortunately, I'm pretty healthy, so I don't have to. But, yeah. but no, won't ever touch it. Because you're friends with Mike Tyson, and he has his own marijuana <laughs> plant. I'm thinking maybe uh, Big Mike will give you a taste. Well, he tried. <laughs> you know, I, I did his hot boxing thing, and he's smoking. He says, I said, hey, I'm going to be the first guy that refuses a joint, so don't give me any. I love it. Yeah. yeah. But you've got wine, wine uh, companies, right? I'm in a wine business. Yeah, oh. Francis Wine. Yeah. I'm a I'm a big uh, fan of wine, so hopefully I'll get some of that. Well, you're going to give me your address. Well, well, actually, I got some bottles coming over here, so I'll make sure you get one. For sure. <sighs> Amazing. And, go, and going back to this, um, you know, this right in the middle of your life that you're in in the story, you were talking about murders not being as common as what people think. Right. Um, in terms of the brutality, uh, you know, and how violent it could be, um, one guy who sort of been, uh, you know, waxing about how you know in depth and how violent his murders were with the Iceman. Mm -hmm. And you've kind of talked a little bit about him. Um, are you now sort of settled on it was mainly bullshit with him or do you think he was the real deal? It, it was BS with respect to, uh, in the movie, they mm -hmm. had him like a very prominent figure with Roy DeMeo and all of that. Mm -hmm. That wasn't true. Absolutely not true. I mean, I knew Roy fairly well. Mm -hmm. Um, so they, they really, you know, overplayed it in, in the movie, but look, I have to tell you this, you know, I, I'll mention Roy DeMeo and I don't like talking about people, but he's gone now. He was a different character. I mean, Roy, Roy was a, a serial killer. I mean, there's no other way to describe it, you know, and I, I like to tell people this, the mafia did not make Roy who he was. He would have been the same way without our life. I mean, actually, we, you know, we, we made it easier for him because he had, you know, men and group of people around him. But, you know, Brian, I don't know anybody of that caliber that was that brutal that lasted in that life. You don't last mm -hmm. because people say, who wants to mess with this guy? You know, let's get rid of him. Everybody I knew that was murder first never lasted in that life. 
Can you give an example of how brutal he was to people who don't understand the, the level? Oh, gosh. Well, he had a, you know, I mean, they, and again, the media always, always overplays this. The media said my dad was responsible for 40 murders, mm -hmm. but never named one, mm -hmm. you know, so they, they, who knows? But Roy, they said over 200 murders in that life, and this was highly publicized. But he did have a, a, a method called the Gemini method. He had a club in, uh, in, in the city. And he would bring guys in there and actually murder them, chop up their bodies and, and dispose of them. And that was a fact. I mean, that happened. As a matter of fact, one of the guys responsible for that is getting out of prison fairly soon. You know, that, oh, wow. was, that was part of Roy. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully he's, he's changed his life and calmed down a bit. But uh, yeah. it was pretty, he was a brutal guy. No question about it. Of all the guys you met in, in your own family and your like close um, work and relationships, maybe, was there one that stuck out to you as the one of the scariest guys? You know, the only guy that I ever had to be concerned about and that was scary to me was my boss, Carmine Persigo. He was a real he was a real deal, an old time a tough guy, no question about it. He was a street warrior. And I had to watch myself with him because he had the power of life and death over me. Mm -hmm. He was a guy. Did you say he was nicknamed the Snake or something? They, call the, they called him the Snake. Yeah. yeah, that was the reputation that he had. I got along great. With That's him. a worrying nickname in that line yeah, of work. Yeah. I mean, I got along great with him. You know, we like until until I walked away. Then he was very upset with me, but he was already doing a hundred years in prison at that point. Mm. But um, you know, people say, "Well, you were afraid of Roy DeMeo." I had no reason to be afraid of Roy DeMeo. You know, look, I have to say this, Brian. We were all capable of putting a gun in our hands and doing what we had to do. So I didn't have to worry about anybody yeah. except my boss if I were to step out of line. So I didn't worry about anybody else in that regard. But I had, you know, I was very mindful of doing the right thing so that I didn't put myself in trouble. And guys in the mafia are always portrayed as having multiple women, you know, the Gumar thing and the, like on the Sopranos, the, the wait, I'll be greeting him as if he hasn't seen him in a week when he's seen him last night. Yeah. Is, is that the way it was with multiple women or? It is part of the life. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, disavow that, but it's not as, as out there as people make, you, you know, as you see in the movies and the media, it wasn't that guys didn't respect their wives. I mean, they did. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's a lifestyle where you're out six nights. I was in a club six nights a week. Mm -hmm. So, you know, who's in there? And then, of course, you know, women are attracted to us. Mm -hmm. I have to say it, you know, whether it's the money, the power, the bad boy image or who knows, you know. So you have women around all the time. So if you put yourself in the lion's den, so to speak, you know, it's part of that life. I heard you telling a story about uh, a gay guy in the mafia. And I wondered if that was something that uh, was, you know, happened every now and then or if it would be exposed or death. Really? Oh, yeah. No, absolutely frowned upon. You, you'd you be in a lot of trouble. Wow. Yeah. You'd get killed over that. Oh, yeah. Wow. Without a doubt. Yeah, you can't, I mean, you better not expose that. Wow. Yeah, instant. I mean, because we're in such a different world right now, right? And yeah. I think even for people who've watched all these movies, even just to hear that is it, quite shocking, yeah. you know? Um, no, it was, I mean, it was... Did you ever hear of that happening to a gay guy? No, no well, not as part of our life, mm. no. Now, you know, the ironic thing is that, you know, back in the 70s, a lot of guys were involved with gay bars, mm -hmm. you know, because we wouldn't let them operate unless they were paying us off. So, <laughs> you know, so, I mean, we were involved with gay bars, but you couldn't be in that lifestyle. Yeah. No. Couldn't. Wow. Did you ever have uh, a friend who just disappeared one day? Like, and no one ever... You won't be seeing here anymore. Like that sort of thing that you see in the movie. It's like where a guy you've known for 10 years is just gone and there's no explanation, no questions. We were one of the warring families. There was three wars in the Colombo family during my lifetime. Well, that's a lot. You didn't see that in, in the other families for some reason. I don't know why, but um, yeah, there were, there were many guys that I knew one day were gone the next. You know, one of the most horrible things... Um, it was a lot of things that you witness in that life, but I had a guy around me. He was actually around my dad first. His big Tony, his name was. Real tough guy, stand-up soldier guy. He comes to me one day. My dad was away, so he was under me. He was one of my guys. And he said to me, I'm in a lot of trouble. I said, what happened? He says, I got involved in a little drug deal. 
and the boss's son was with me. We sold to an undercover agent. And I said, I got upset. I said, how could you do that? You know, we went through that. And I said, all right, don't worry about it. I'll straighten it out. You've been a guy for a long time. You're very well respected. He said, no, nah, they're going to blame it all on me. He said, the boss's son is going to skate on this, and they're going to blame it all on me. Don't worry about it, this and that and that. Right? I get on a plane. I had a plane at that time, and I head down to Florida. I get to Florida, and I get a call from another one of my guys. He says, Mike, you're not going to believe this. I said, what? He said, Tony went into a phone booth and blew his brains out. And the reason for that, you know, one of the horrors of that life, you make a mistake, your best friend walks you into a room, you don't walk out again. And he had said, I'm not going to let that happen to me. I'm not going to walk into that room. He was so scared that he had violated that, that he took his own life. Went into a phone booth because I knew his wife and, everything, and he, he called her up and he said, I love you. I love the kids. And she didn't understand what he was doing. And boom. I mean, that's the kind of fear that that life could put into you. And he was an old timer. So he, he understood. So that was a shock to me. That was like, wow, you know, how could you do this? You know, but even though he knew that I would go to bat for him, he was even, well, because look, you're told straight out, you know, your best friend is going to walk you into that room. So even though I was trying to assure him, he said, Mike, I know the life too well. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's so much like Goodfellas that in regards to the, the scene where like Henry and... Um, when Joe Pesci walks into the room, yeah. remember? And he thought he was being made and boom. And, uh, and that's a reality of that life. But even, even for example, when Henry Hill is talking to uh, De Niro's character and they're having dinner and he's like, he's, he's narrating over it going, yeah, I know yeah. he's terrified and he's, he's, he's plotting yes. and he's telling me everything's going to be okay. It's not going to be okay. He's exactly. the one who wants to kill me. Exactly. And that's kind of, must have been how your guy felt. But like in terms of you hearing that news, that's the sort of thing that plays on the mind for days, maybe weeks, months afterwards. How was that for you knowing that you had that conversation with him and, even though you reassured him, it didn't matter. Like, Well, it, it was shocking to the point where I had my own experience that way. You know, Brian, when what happened was there was an article, and I'll, I'll relate it this way. I mean, that was devastating to me because mm. I knew him since I was a kid. Wow. I used to, when I was a kid, I called him Uncle Tony. He was that close to me and my family. My father was like one of his right-hand guys, so it was shocking. But, um, and I'm saying, man, you know, he didn't trust me. And I understood that. But, you know, when I was making a lot of money, there was an article that came out, I think it was the Long Island Press, that said that I was becoming powerful enough to break away from the Columbos and stop my own family. No truth to it. It was like a fictional story. I had no truth whatsoever. But it starts to get into people's heads. And like I said, we were a warring family. So my boss started to get a little, I got a big crew. I got the Russians involved with me. My dad still had a lot of juice. I'm making tons of money, making friends with other families. So You're a threat. Yeah. So it's like I'm perceived that way, even though I wasn't, right? So I get a call one day. My dad's on parole. Mike, I got to see you. So I go see him. My boss wants to see us tonight. I said, okay, what time do you want me to pick you up? right? Because he was uh, on parole. I used to drive him. Well, they want you to come in first. They want me to come in second. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. I didn't want to do that because I said, dad, why are they going to separate us? Let's go together. You know, no, 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 no. They, we got an order. We got to do it that way. Long story short, I argued with him a little bit, but then gave in. I drive into Brooklyn and to meet with another guy who I knew my whole life, Jimmy, and uh, I had to park my car. I got with him because the boss was on parole. So we had to make sure we didn't have a tail, right? Nobody was following us. We get to this house in Brooklyn where the meeting was going to take place. And I get out of the car. Jimmy walks behind me. There was a guy sitting in the back who I kind of recognized but didn't know him well. And he walks behind me. And I'm saying, this isn't right. Something's not right here. I don't like this setup. I'll be honest with you, Brian. I got scared. I said, man, they walking me into this room. I said, that stupid article. I heard they, they went and tried to talk to some of my guys. And right away, I'm thinking, I'm in trouble. And uh, we go down the steps. And it was probably a 30-yard walk from the car to the basement. I almost, when that door opened, I almost fainted. I said, I know the setup. They're going to guide me. Boom, I'm going to get it right in the side of the head, right? Um, 
But I can tell you, it it made a difference because it was set up that way to scare me. Mm-hmm. It, there's no question about it. And that meeting, I never, I mean, obviously I'm here. It worked out okay, but it stayed in my head. And I said, man, I'm making all of this money and I'm being put on the spot. I'm bringing money into the family. I says, I can't trust anybody here. And my father didn't do the right thing that night. My father was in there before me. And he kind of threw me under the bus. Hey, if my son is stealing money, I don't know anything about it. He does everything. I don't do anything. I'm on parole. Whoa. He took the high road. I found this out. And I was like, wow. You know, and I, uh, I didn't say anything for two years. I didn't say, you, you don't, in that life, you don't speak out of turn. You don't discuss things with anybody. You keep your mouth shut, your feelings inside. But that had a ba- major impact on my decision to walk away. That must have broke your heart to a degree. It did break my heart because I said to myself, man, if this life can separate father and son, because my dad and I were tight, Mm. I said, what do we really have here? You know, it was, it made a a big impact on me. It's, I mean, look, I always relate things back to the movies whenever I'm hearing your stories, because that's kind of like a Fredo moment of like, like we were supposed to be tight and yeah. now you're you're playing both sides like I thought you know what I mean and um, and for someone you've idolized your whole life who, who you have so much respect for to do something not honorable towards you it's heavy that like it, it really hurt mm. it really hurt and you know when I was I'll never forget Brian when I, I when I talk about this I it was a summer night in August I could practically smell the flowers that's how intense my feelings were exactly and people said to me well, why didn't you cut and run and i said well it wasn't heroic it was kind of robotic i said i was so much a part of that life i said if this is it this is it i almost gave in to my death mm-hmm. how crazy is that when i think about it you know right but you get so programmed you get so part of it that it's part of who you are and you face it that way. Sort of brainwashed almost. Like, yeah. Like the army, because you kind of are soldiers, a lot of you guys, and that's yeah. kind of the, the mentality is like, you you know, soldiers will run to their death because it's been what they've been told to do they've from been, day one. Exactly. Yeah. But you know what, Brian, it helped me later on because when I walked away from that life, I knew I was going to have some trouble. You know, people weren't going to just let me go. Mm. Uh, but I already knew. I said, well, I faced death once. If I got to face it again, I'll do it for the right reason. It's almost like it helped me later on because I didn't have that fear. I mean, ironically, what it was supposed to do, it did the opposite. It was supposed to give them control, but it actually made you more fearless yeah. because you were like, well, if you're going to take me, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go quietly next time. It's yeah. going to be a lot different. And I can only assume the, um, the sheer volume of cash you were bringing through the door could have been one of the main reasons they, they gave you the warning and not the final shot that night yeah no question about that and you know i we sat down you know what happened we were at the meeting and they're questioning me i started getting mad i'm saying now i'm bringing all this money in and now i'm being put on a spot because of some stupid article that was written in a paper i said when they write articles about everybody else it's false now they're writing something about me it's true i said Dude, i don't know this there's nonsense because their real insecurities were yeah. getting triggered it wasn't it was, yeah yeah, so I wonder if you getting angry helped your case a bit there, because well, you know, you can't get angry with the boss. So <laughs> I, I, I caught myself. I said, "Wait a minute, I'm walking out of here. Let me just, you know." And then when it was over, you know, hey, have a glass of wine and they're hugging and everything is good, you know. No, no <laughs> yeah, that's how it goes. Off. We were ready to kill you off now, Ruth. Exactly. This is crazy. Exactly. And I got a little nervous because my dad wasn't in there when I went. He oh, had yeah. already gone. He went in first. And I'm saying, where's my father? Oh, he, he was here. He's, he's left. Now I'm saying to myself, Is did he, he really leave? Am I going to get, I mean, all these emotions, am I going to get killed here? Who's standing behind me? All this stuff is going through my head. Now I might've been visibly showing him that I was nervous, tried not to, tried to keep my composure, but you know, it is what it is. But then, like I said, it started to turn to anger that you put me on a spot here. Are you kidding me? You know? And then you don't seem like an out. angry guy either. So like, I, if there's one thing that comes off with, a lot of even the videos you did with Sammy and you're very calm, composed, considered. And I, I always think that that's why you're one of the people who le- like lasted the way you did. But in that moment for you to say, I, lo- I was losing it yeah. shows the intensity of the situation. Yeah, it, it was very, uh, I mean, look, I remember every little detail about that night. Mm-hmm. It's, it's amazing. It's probably one of the most standout things in my life.
The role of uh, conciliary is something we've uh, seen a lot in these movies, and I, I wondered uh, if you could educate us on the the power of one and how they are selected. The conciliary is totally the selection of the boss. You know, that's his advisor, so to, so to speak. And his real role, he's supposed to be an intermediary between the soldiers, the men, and the boss. Because if you have a problem with the boss or some. You can't go directly to the boss. You're not allowed to do that. If you're a captain, you can. But if you're a soldier, you can't. So you go to the consigliere, who's the consigliere allegedly for the family. The problem is if you go to the consigliere with a complaint about the boss, you're probably not going to last right? <laughs> because he's the boss's handpicked guy. So you, you don't do that. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's good to have a consigliere that will disagree with you and not just yes you to death. Because you're supposed to run things by him in the family. It's a powerful position. Don't mm-hmm. get me wrong. But, you know, I've noticed in that life, you know, that the consigliere and the boss are always, it's almost like one person. You know, they, they have the same thought pattern, the same everything. So, you know, with me, I just stay in good graces with everybody. That's how I tried to do it. I suppose the, the best idea is to pick someone who will... Um, contain your impulses and try and help you lead in a more calm way like rather, rather yeah than- and, and and a good thing is the consigliere normally um deals with the other families also mm. so you have to have a guy that's been around that knows how to deal with people that's there's kind of well respect obviously well respected mm. so uh every consigliere that i knew they were old old timers so when you get arrested and you are on trial uh, in your position, I assume the the guys in the family are worried that you're going to say the information to the cops. Um, did, did at any point did you say anything looking back at it that you regretted to the cops when they were interrogating you? No, well, during my arrests, you know, and I, I had so many of them, but um, I don't think anybody was ever worried when I was on trial five times. Mm. Uh, because at that point, you know, there was no reason for anybody to worry about anything. You know, the controversy with me afterwards, after I walked away, then everybody was worried. Okay. Because you're going to cooperate. What's, uh, what's really going on? And the feds added to that because they put it out there. You know, they put my name on a witness list of trials that were going on. And so people thought I was coming in to cooperate, but I never showed up because I wasn't doing it. That was what the feds were doing. And look, I spoke to the uh, to the law enforcement, but I didn't give them any information that could put people in prison. You know, I knew what I could do and what I couldn't do. And mainly I put a lot of stuff on myself, you know. So, look, Brian, I was never willing to go into the witness protection program. I was never willing to put people in jail. That was something I wouldn't do. I would never cross that line. But I needed to show the government that, that I was really out because I wanted them to leave me alone, basically. I was so high profile. I arrested 18 times, three racketeering cases, two federal, one state. You know, leave me alone. I had enough. I'm walking away from the life. Yeah, you want, yeah, this is what I did and this and that and that. Yeah, there is a cost on Oster and all of that. But that was my limit. And just, just so they leave me alone. And then when they put my name on a witness list, everybody was nervous, including my father. But I kept sending my father a message, Dad, I'm not hurting anybody. Don't listen to these people. I do five years in prison. I get out on parole for 13 months. I got a lot of trouble, right? Both both sides. Who's looking to kill me? Who's looking to put me in a program? It was a mess. 13 months, a mess. I violate my parole. They put me back in prison. So now everybody's saying, why would they put this guy back in prison if he was going to hurt anybody? Mm-hmm. The, 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 in the discovery, they see my name, but then I never show up. So that's when they realized, okay, he's not hurting anybody, you know, so things started to calm down. But this was a long period of time, you know. You know, look, uh, you, you got to do what you got to do if you want to preserve your family. I get it. But to me, there was a limitation. I wasn't willing to put anybody in jail. I, and I told the feds that. I said, I don't care what you say. I said, don't ever ask me about my father. Not one word will I ever discuss about him, about anything. And they they understood that. And I said. Just, you know, I'm not doing it, period. It must have had much on you in order to put stress on you to try and pressurize you to give people up or stuff like that. They, oh, yeah. they, 
you know, they're tactics back then. We're, you, you, we're indicting you for murder. We're doing it. I mean, they hit me with everything. Uh-huh. I mean, when I was in prison, they put me on diesel therapy, shipped me to all different prisons around the country, picked me up in the middle of the night, put you on a plane, you end up someplace, you don't even know where you're going. Can't visit. They don't tell your family. Security reasons. Then they had me in lockdown for 29 months and seven days. In solitary. You did 29 months solitary. 29 months and seven, 29 months and seven days. You remember every day. They had me in solitary. You know, claim it was for my own protection because I walked away from the life, but they were giving me the business. And during that time, you want to get out of here, you know, just talk to us and leave me alone, you know? So they're making it as hard as possible Absolutely. so that you, they break you. Absolutely. And, you know, look, there was a recent video and, uh, you know, the guy that prosecuted me said, you know, Michael could have put everybody away. He was with Fat Tony and he was with Persico and he was, the guy said it, the mm. prosecutor right on there. But I wasn't willing to do that. So do you think you've got the credit for that, that you probably should have had, though? Because I see the way, like when I was watching the way Sammy was talking to you, like it wasn't like that. Like when I hear 29 months solitary confinement and you didn't break, that deserves like respect that like and i'm not saying you don't get respect but those people should owe you a level of gratitude for not doing that well i think afterwards they did you know you know what happened there was uh when i was getting out of prison finally my second stint there was a there was a guy that was trying to implicate me in a, in a bunch of murders he was an informant right turns out they threw him out of the witness protection program for lying But the, the feds had came to me at the time and they said, listen, this guy's implicating you in all of these deals. I said, well, he's lying, you know? And this was before they found out that he was lying. I said, the guy's a liar. But they said to me, look, you're either going to cooperate with us because he's implicated other guys or we're going to indict you for what this guy is saying. I said, take your best shot. I told him, right? <laughs> and I went back to my father at the time wow. and I said, dad, I said, if I cooperate with this guy... I said, everybody's going to get hurt. I'm not going to do it. Tell them to leave me alone. And he told him that. You know, he told my boss and everything. Leave my, my son is not hurting anybody. And that went a long way. Mm -hmm. And then what happens, the guy that said all of this, they threw him out of the program for lying. He was a bad liar. Mm -hmm. I mean, he lied about so many things. So, you know, fortunately that went and nobody got hurt as a result of what this guy was saying. But... There were so many instances that happened, Brian, that I, when I think about it, you know, how fortunate I am that things just fell into place for me. I mean, it was a lot of work on my part too, but I had to, you know, be very fortunate that the way things broke, you know, honestly. You've navigated things incredibly well in, in one of the most stressful situations, but to, to put solitary confinement into the mix, yeah. can you describe you know, what that does to the mind for that many months on end. Well, let me tell you this. I, I, I am dead set against solitary for young people. Mm -hmm. It's mental torture. It's, it's hard. It's very, very hard. I saw a lot of bad things happen. Guys that couldn't handle it after a period of time in there, it was tough. For me, it was a faith issue. I mean, that's when, you know, I, I really got into my Bible It's, uh, it's when I was really in a search for the truth. And what motivated me is the feds had initially said, you're never getting out of here alive. You're going to spend the rest of your life in solitary. So now I'm thinking of eternity. What's real? You know, my wife was a Christian. My mother-in-law was a Christian. So I started doing my search and I had my wife send me in a whole bunch of books about different faiths. And that's what, that's what really sustained me. That and my strong determination and desire to get out and be with my wife and my children, you know, my kids. And so I didn't let it get to me. It was tough. Don't get me wrong. I had some very bad days in there. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, some reason I was able to navigate it. But it's it's hard. It, it really is. It's hard. It, you know, I've always I've always kind of assumed because it is a bit cliche. My dad was in prison a lot of my life. And it's kind of like the, the thing that happens is men go to prison And it seems like from the outside looking in, they start panicking that, you know, they're going to meet their maker sooner or later and they better start apologizing for what they've been up to, where they've been here. And maybe they're just trying to get in the Lord's good graces before they meet him. Mm -hmm. um, but do you think that there was, it felt like there was more to it for you when you were going through such a literal dark time and, and reading the Bible? Do you think that that made you grow as a person? Yeah, no question. No yeah. question. I started to look at things differently. My mentality, remember, mob mentality all the way. 
I started to see things differently. You know, one of the books in the Bible that was so attractive to me was the book of Proverbs because it was such a wise book. You could, you could take God out of the equation for a minute and just listen to the wisdom of Solomon. Brilliant, mm-hmm. brilliant. And I started to see things differently. And it really did change my mentality and my heart to a, to a degree and prepared me for what was, you know, a, a new life, you know, mm-hmm. fish out of water. I'm coming out of Brooklyn and the whole mob thing, going into L.A., a whole different atmosphere, and now trying to live life legitimately in the right way and take care of my family. So it was a good preparation for that. Um, and it really, I started to see things a lot differently, really. Did, did it, obviously, the, you know, the Bible is all about essentially what you should do and how you should live your life. Mm-hmm. Did it make you feel more guilty than you'd felt previously about the things you'd done to people? Um, it, it, it made me confront myself. You know, there was one verse, if you notice, I have it on my arm yeah. and it says, uh, it's Proverbs sixteen seven. when a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, even his enemies are at peace with him. So it was one of the first verses that I read that really got to me because it was the first night that they threw me in a hole and they told me, you're never getting out of here. This is it. You'll never see your wife and children again. And it was the first time that I was scared. I said, I have no control. I'm a control guy by nature. Yep. No control. I lost it. They beat me. And when I read that verse, I said, man, I've got nothing but enemies on both sides. The opposite me, the people on the street, I said, man, I'm going to lose my wife and kids. I'm done. And you know, I'll tell you how serious it was. I used to demean people that were suicidal. I said, you're weak. How do you not face up to you? Weak. That night, I wasn't suicidal, but I kind of understood. I wanted to just lay my head on that cot and not wake up uh-huh. because I said, I'm going to do this to my family. I visited my father 25 years. My mother practically lost her mind. I said, I'm going to torture this woman. I don't know if she's going to leave me, my wife. I said, just take me away. I wanted to lay down and not wake up. Uh-huh. It was that serious. So when I read that verse, it was almost like uh, man's ways of pleasing to the Lord. I looked back, I said, who are you kidding? I said, you got to confront what you've done in your life. And I really started to think about everything, what I had done during my time in that life. And I said, this is bad. And yeah, I had regrets. There's no question. Mm-hmm. And so I didn't, you know, when you're in the life, you justify it. Hey, we all took the oath, <laughs> right? And Everyone now, does this. That's why I'm laughing. I've done you, it. Yeah. yeah, you justify it. But you know what? You could say no also. Yeah. You know, okay, you may face consequences, but that's a choice you made. I made the choice to go along with it. So, yeah, I started to confront my own demons, so to speak, during that time. It's funny you should say that because in the past couple of years, I've definitely tried to be like, I've tried to make those changes of of the not living the way I used to and, mm-hmm. and being that person that I used to. Not that I was a really bad guy, but I'd make selfish decisions a lot of the time. And I found it a really painful process in, in looking at everything and trying to do the right thing. Because sometimes people don't always want you to do the right thing. You know That's what I right. mean? And it can be that you know, an emotional situation to be in for sure. Oh, it's a, yeah, you know what, Brian, I found this, you know, it's, it's a message that I give to these young bang, gang bangers. I mm-hmm. tell them, listen, you are who you hang out with. That's it. In life, there's two things. You are who you hang out with and your path in life is going to be dictated by who you're accountable to. You know, accountability is everything. Mm-hmm. When I was on the street, I hung out with old criminals. I was a criminal. I was accountable to my boss. I was accountable to my oath. When I came out, I have to credit my wife with this because she's an incredibly, she's an honest person. She's very, very committed to her faith. Mm -hmm. And the influence that she had on me, number one, I didn't want to disappoint her. And number two, she wouldn't stand for me doing anything wrong. So she helped me change my mentality to a great degree. And then over a period of time, when you're around somebody that's so consistent, it really helps you. And she she was a major force in my life. I was ready for her. You know, I had gotten a lot of <laughs> stuff out of my system. Uh-huh. And fortunately, I met the right woman to keep me in the right place. Yeah, everything you're saying is very applicable to my own life in the last few years of like clearing out people who shouldn't be around you. You mm-hmm. know, like uh, a, a, a close person to me calls it like cutting the dead leaves off the tree to let it grow better. And and you, like you say, the people around you, you know, can be a huge difference. But also the woman in your life can make you or break you. 
without a doubt. And uh, uh, this, this, that, that's one thing I've talked to a lot of, because I see young YouTube guys getting a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, pick the woman carefully. 100%. And I'm not just talking about the ones who give you a good time and all that. Like, think about this, lads. That's why one, one of the things that I think young men, they don't understand the level of importance until it's too late. 100%. Yeah. You know, and to bring that up, I don't, I don't know what you're feeling. Do you, do you know Andrew Tate? I do, so, I do. I've had a bit of a run in with him. I, have I, you? I don't. I understand that some things he says are touching a nerve with the young men of today, mm -hmm. and I definitely get why because they feel directionless. But I hear the point of young men; they need guidance right now. Absolutely, and I, I think that that's a. Uh, it's something that they're crying out for now because there are no good male role models out there, man. The, the family unit's been destroyed. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and to me, the root of all the problems that we're having is the destruction of the family. There's mm. no question. You know how many guys, and you, you might have experienced the same, young men I met in prison that were in prison, you could write the same script for every one of them. Broken home, no mm. father figure, no mentor. That's it. Bottom line, they're like little wild animals. They gravitate to the street. They get to the local gangbanger, drug dealer. Before you know it, they're in jail. And and it's also why relationships are breaking down consistently because young women aren't viewing. They're not being raised anymore, young women, to view how a man and a woman are supposed to talk to each other. So, as, You're right. for me personally, when I started dating, uh, you know, women. I didn't sort of understand until now why so many women don't know how to communicate with men. And it's because they've never watched a mother and father do that in a functional way. You're right. They don't say it. So they don't have a clue. So they, women are now talking to men like men themselves. And they're wondering why it's like a volatile relationship all the time. And you see these toxic relationships. It's because no, like the old ways of communicating and the specific gender roles, in my opinion anyway, of a man being a man and a woman being a woman ironically worked absolutely like, and and now we've gotten so far away from that it's almost like we've got no chance of having like thousands of successful relationships the way it used to be well it's funny that you say that here in the uk and it's exactly the same in the united states yeah. and you know i do agree with andrew on on a lot of things mm. i mean men being men mm. the problem is that you know people view that if man is a man and acting like he should that it's demeaning to women and it's mm. not in any way mm. you know it's actually a benefit to women and you want a strong woman. Mm -hmm. Nobody's saying we, we don't. I need a strong woman. My wife is, is the best balance for me in life that I could imagine because she's strong. She's independent. She also knows her role. Mm -hmm. And I know my role. And it's different. But we the yin and the yang fit perfectly. Together. Exactly, yeah. exactly, and and this is what young men and young women have to understand. Mm. You know, be who you are as as what you are. You're a woman. I'm a man, and we complement each other well. I think femininity is the most underappreciated quality in the modern era. Like so many women now are giving up like the femininity and the way they're portraying themselves, the way they're talking, the way they're acting yep. all over their Instagram and stuff like that. Like the, the softer and more gentle you can be towards a man, they'll have them wrap around their little finger. <laughs> and I'm like, you've literally got the superpower right there in your hand. You don't even know how to use it because you've exactly. never been shown. But like, if you communicate with a man in a soft, gentle, feminine way, we're putty in your hands, ladies. Absolutely. It's, it's mental that you aren't even, because do you think by like stamping their feet, being aggressive, being masculine will get them their way because it's probably worked in their household when they were younger. It's like, but when you try and do that at 25 and upwards with a grown man, that's why your relationship's breaking down. 100%. Um, you know, there's a lot of um, backlash now in, you, you, in the United States with feminists who mm. finally saying, you know, the women that, that bought into this, they said, we bought into a big lie. Absolutely. Because now we're 38, 39, 40 years old. We were told we never needed a companion. We didn't need men in our life. And now we can't find one. Well, the cats aren't very good at cuddling <laughs> like yes. when they die. Um, <laughs> but like, um, and another thing is like, to me, feminism, I understand why women felt the, the compelled to want more power. And yes, they weren't treated the way they should have been, but it's just been such an overcorrection now. And, um, and ironically, it's like, well, well done. You're all taxpayers like the rest of us. Like you've given up your role in the home where, and like now a lot of these women are wanting to buy back in and go, oh, actually I want to pr protect the provider who earns all the money and I can just stay with the kids because that's actually what I really want to do. But they're 40 years old and it's too late. Exactly. Uh, it, it, and it's happening all over. Exactly. But you know, my wife, uh, yeah, a couple of things. I mean, I don't let her put gas in the car. 
I feel that's my job. With my, you too. My girl, I didn't. I would yeah. never do that. <laughs> I put dash in the car. You know, I I do I do everything for her. Yeah. Not that she's not very capable of doing it on her own, and she'll do it on her own. She it's doesn't respect in it. Yeah, she doesn't demand me to do it, but I hold her in that high esteem. Yeah. She deserves that, as far as mm. I'm concerned. Hey, look. In my case, I'm gone eight years. My wife stuck, stood by me, you know, totally committed, took care of the kids, raised them properly, mm. went through hell with me with, you know, contract on my life, all the stuff she, she had to go through. So she's earned every bit of that and more, mm. you know, so, but she's capable of doing it on her own. It's not like I'm demeaning of her, course. like, but some women would look at that as, oh, you know, you think I can't do that on my own? Well, of course you can. But if we're, mm. if we want to go out of our way and do that for you and it makes us feel good and it treats you a certain way why are you mad about that some 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 women I, I see interviews and look they go viral because they're they're ridiculous sometimes so they they're meant to be triggering but i see someone who want it kind of both ways mm -hmm. they want the independence but they also want the guy who's going to do it like everything and yeah i don't know i i'm really glad that I ain't got to pick a wife out of the future generations. Absolutely. God bless these young men out here if they're watching. Um, but yeah, I, I completely see where you're coming from, mate. So we were talking about the time you were in jail. And obviously you mentioned your father's time in jail and he being framed. How common do you think it was for people in your business to be framed by the police back in the day? Normally an investigation starts, a crime is committed and then law enforcement investigates the crime, right? Mm -hmm. Well, with us guys, they don't know what the crime is. They're investigating the guys <laughs> waiting to see what crime is committed, you know? <laughs> so um, It's like reverse engineering it. Exactly. They must have done something. They must have done, well, let's yeah. figure out what it is. Yeah. So they surveil us, they watch us, they talk to people, they try to find out. He's got to be involved in something. We think we know what it is. And so it gives them leeway to, you know what I mean, to exaggerate to a point where it's frame. And my dad's out and out frame. Very simple. These bank robbers really robbed all the banks. They just created one meeting and said my dad was at that meeting and ordered them to do it. That was it. Wow. One meeting, he ordered them to do it, but the bank's robberies actually took place. And, and what happened is the FBI put the, my dad's name in their thinking, mm -hmm. they knew my father, they knew of my father because of, of his reputation. And so it was easy to set it up and the jury bought it, mm -hmm. you know, the jury bought it. But the thing is in the federal system, you don't need any corroboration. You can be, you can go to jail on the basis of one person, you know, telling a story about wow. you. If the jury buys it, they buy it. Normally they'll want to present a little bit more than that, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, it's a tough system. And you, you've been put on the spot quite a few times about, oh, have you killed people? Da, 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 da. And I've seen Sammy sort of, you know, putting it on you a bit about, well, what did you do? And you were like, well, I can't really say what. Um, but I've got a hypothetical question that sort of broaches it because I was thinking about this, um, knowing that you can't say anything like to that level. But let's just say, hypothetically, if you had have taken another man's life in the, in, in the life you were in, the character you have and the person you are now, someone who is religious and really believes in doing the right thing, it seems. Let's just say that you're on your deathbed one day. Do you think that if you had have done that, that you are the type of person who would say that on your deathbed? Or do you think that you would never speak of it? Well, let's put it this way. I, uh, I made, you know, I'm a Christian and I made my peace with God. Mm. And fortunately, as a Christian, you don't have to make your peace with anybody else. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm going to say I had a uh, sit down with Jordan Peterson. Mm. Okay. Great man. Brilliant guy. Yeah, I've had Great him on the guy. show. And he said to me, my, I said, look, Jordan, you know, there were certain things I did in that life that I was very uncomfortable with. Uh, I did them anyway. And he said, well, how'd you do that? And I said, well... Quite honestly, I kind of stepped outside of myself <clears throat> and did what I had to do and then came back into myself. And and I think that's how I approached it. Hey, I've got an order. This has got to be done. Boom. But then Jordan said to me, well, is the real person the person that steps out of himself or the person that stepped back? And I said, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> I said, I'd like to think it was the person that I stepped back into because I don't have those same thoughts now. Look, am I capable of doing, st I'm a made member of that life. Of course you're capable. Um, but I'm not 
I'm not at liberty to talk about anything. I, you know, to me, I, to me, it's offensive too to people to talk about. There's other guys that brag about it. I don't understand how they do that. You know, and my father taught me something once. He said to me this, and and it stuck with me. And it it might be one of the reasons why I didn't have certain trouble in my life. He said to me, Mike, if you and I were out and we robbed a store. 15 seconds after we robbed that store, if you say to me, Dad, that was a good deal we did, I, he would say to me, what are you talking about? He said, why would you ever bring it up again? Why would you put yourself in trouble or expose yourself? He said, you never, ever have to talk about something that you did. Done. Mm-hmm. Finished. When it's illegal activity. So I, that's always been in my head. You know, I also said something to Jordan. This is interesting. He said, Michael, how do you feel about lying? And I said, well, my dad, again, put something in my head. I would never lie to hurt somebody. I might lie to help somebody. And he looked at me and said, well, lying is lying. Mm-hmm. I said, I know, but I'm lying to help somebody. You know, for instance, you know, my son, you know, got himself in trouble. The cops came to me. Did your son do this? I'd say, no. Mm-hmm. I want to help my son. He's my blood. He's this and that. And he had an issue with that. And it started to make me think. You know, Michael, you can't justify lying. Lying is lying is lying. But I don't agree with that. I'm going to be honest with you. If I had to help somebody, somebody in my family, I I may lie to help them. And There's I also still, white lies, which are seen to be less hurtful to people. Yeah. Yeah. But to lie to hurt somebody and lie to put somebody in trouble, no. That to me is very offensive and it's it's cowardly. I wouldn't and, do that. And keeping your mouth shut, even to regular people, say, for example, if I'm talking to a young YouTuber and they're starting to get a load of money, my advice would be keep your mouth shut because people are envious. So envious 100%. people, as I've found out, envious people will stab you in the back the first chance they get, and that's on an on an everyday level. Like, and you you know, this is the, the world of YouTube, Christ sakes. Um, so um, apologies, I shouldn't say that in front of a religious man like yourself. That's okay, I get, <laughs> I get it. No, but um, but you know what? Psychologically, you're talking about what Jordan Peterson said, and he has an interesting question because you've lived a life with people around you who were, who were able to kill and kill many people, the average person, the average people, how able to do that do you think most people would be if they were in the situation where no one finds out and you're put on the spot, you've got to do this or else this? Like, Where do you rank average people in that sense? I think it would be hard for some, but I think most could do it. You know, I, I'm going to say something that's kind of controversial and, and, and I hope people don't get me wrong. You know, but you take a young man, 18 years old, you put him in the military, he's trained to fight and kill, Mm -hmm. you know? And the way I look at it is murder is murder. If you have the ability, if it's in you to kill somebody, it's still murder. It might Mm -hmm. be justified. Don't get me wrong, because you're fighting for your country. You're defending people. I get it. And I'm not comparing that to murder in the mob because they're the different reasons. Mm -hmm. But you're still capable of doing that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You're committing a murder whatever the circumstances are. So I guess in answer to your question, I think I think a lot of people are capable of doing that mm-hmm. if they were put in a situation. And yeah, like this is, I got to do this and nobody's going to know about it. Because some of the things you hear, I don't know how it is here, but I read things in the papers every day. I cannot believe some of the things that are happening. I mean, women killing their husband, killing their kids. And it's like, it has to be a mental illness issue with them. But uh, it's more prevalent than we think. Mm. You know, we look at murder as the ultimate sin, and probably it is, but it happens quite a bit. I mean, yeah, and it, it's obviously generations of, of of people, savages building up into society that we have yeah. now. Like this, is, it was very common. Like you know, when when especially back when the laws were nowhere near as strict, and the ability to stop people from killing people was nowhere near. And speaking for myself, like I think I'm a good guy. I would never want to murder anyone. But in the circumstances, if it's me or versus another guy, then like you got to do what you got to do. I suppose if you had to defend yourself or defend your, your family, family, but hey, no choice is there really. No. You're yeah. going to do it. And I think most people can do it in that situation, mm. you know? So it's in you as a human being. Again, it's, 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 look, you separate that from people that are just insanely murderous. You know, mm. we, we've known them. Um, it feels like when you're describing some of those guys earlier that almost, you know, the mafia was the vehicle for them to um, enjoy that thrill. 
like you said, they were just serial killers who happened to be in the mafia. But if they exactly. weren't, they would have been out like lunatics. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I, uh, that's that's the truth. So you mentioned earlier about leaving the mafia. Can you describe how that felt when you finally felt free, and you know how that came about? How because to mastermind that must have been really difficult. You know, it was difficult. I would <laughs> for for a long time. I struggled. I would go to bed leaving the life, wake up, no, I can't do this. And for me, it was it was probably even more difficult because the relationship I had with my dad and not wanting to betray him in his mind, you know. Mm -hmm. So it was really a, a struggle, an emotional, you know, struggle with me. And when I walked away, you know, I, I'll tell you a, a story. I got violated, and just before I got violated, my dad called me. He was on parole, and I was out in California. I was on parole, and he said, we need you back here. Your family's going to war. We were having another war in our family, overpower, right, struggle. And he said, stop your nonsense, walking away, we need you. And I was so torn, Brian, so torn. I said, man, how could I turn my back on guys? They need me and mm. blah, blah, blah. And I'm back. And I would, again, I was trying to figure out a way how to break my parole, not really tell my wife and go back to New York and see what I can do to try to help in some way the side that I would be on. And I had made the decision to go back. I said, no, I got to do this. I was feeling just terrible. Well, what happens just after I make the decision, I'm walking out of a bank and there's 15 agents, they violate my parole and I'm going into solitary for 29 months and seven days. I was in solitary the entire time the war went on. Oh, wow. I get released and the war is over. So Was that a blessing in disguise? Absolutely. Absolutely a blessing in disguise. I probably wouldn't be here right yeah, now exactly. had I engaged in that. So, you know, fortunately, and again, to me, it's a faith issue, you know, God had a different plan for me, for sure, because I had made the wrong decision. I had made the wrong decision, dumb decision, and I would have destroyed my life and my family and everything else. Obviously, the the mafia still exists to some degree. Um, how do you think those guys look at you now? Well, since there's a whole new generation of guys, everybody in my life that I knew, dead or in prison, they're all gone. Mm. And I think, uh, I don't think they have a real resentment towards me. I honestly don't. Mm -hmm. And I know that because of, you know, I, I'll share this with you. There was one guy that was my cop regime. He was my captain. And I was very, very close with him. And he did some time in prison. He got out and he was the boss of the family for a while. Mm -hmm. And when I was visiting my father, uh, my father said, let's go see him. He wants to see you. So this was an old time guy. This was after everything. And, but we had gotten along really well. So I think the attitude on the street was he didn't hurt anybody. You know, it's OK. I honestly and, and I don't want to come off the wrong way. I think a lot of guys say, man, because they see I have a life for myself. I got a wife. I got kids. I got grandkids. We're on YouTube. We're doing things. I got I think a lot of guys say, you know what? I, I wish I could reach that level. Or have that peace in my life yeah. and have that, you know, I think there are guys, because look, it's a tough life to navigate, man. And I believe a lot of guys that are in it, if they could have lived their life differently, they would. Did you have like, like any vices that you turned to, you know, because you said you weren't really a drug guy, but, you know, like when a man's stressed and pressure, uh, men do things. So do you, did you have a vice that you would use to take that pressure off? Honestly, no. I mean, That's unbelievable. I, I never drank, mm. really. Now I love wine. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I drink, I drink wine, obviously. My wife and I, we go to Napa Valley. We enjoy that. Mm. And again, I, tri I attribute a lot of that to my dad. My dad was very disciplined in his behavior. Mm. He didn't smoke. He didn't drink. You know, mm. he, he didn't do drugs ever. He hated drugs, you know. So, And I really wanted to em please him and emulate him. And so, I mean, I... That's why, you know, people, oh, your dad was this. I said, hey, when I was growing up, he was a good father. He taught me the right way. He taught me to respect women. He taught me to have integrity, you know? So a lot of people, oh, but your dad was a killer. He was this, he was that. My issue with my dad was this, and I'll, I'll, I'll bring it out. You know, I, after my mom passed away, I sat down with him, and what got me is that he didn't take responsibility for the destruction of his family. 
And he would say to me, he would actually blame my mother, blame this. And I, and I said, dad, you need to take responsibility. Uh He said, nope, not my fault. I got framed. If I didn't get framed, none of this would happen. I said, dad, you didn't get framed because you were a doctor, a lawyer, or a priest. (laughs) You got framed because we're mobsters and that's what they do. We understand that. He could never accept it. Accountability is huge, isn't it? In in forgiveness. Like it's very hard to forgive someone unless they're coming to you with good faith. Yeah. Uh, Now he might've accepted that internally, but he couldn't say it out loud. And it, it, I had a, I had an issue with that with him because he blamed my mom for a lot of things, mm. you know. And I said, "Come on, you know." And and initially, so my, I would blame my mom. I always took my father's side, always, until she got sick and was passing away, and I spent a lot of time with her. And she said things to me that never, I guess, because now I'm married and I, I love this woman, and I looked at what my mother said from a different perspective, mm. and my wife understood my mother a lot better than I did. She said, what do you expect from this woman? Look what she went through. And I never looked at it that way. We looked at things differently. Yeah. So she opened my eyes and I was more open to what my mother had to say. And, you know, I don't know, you know, it's, it's amazing. I don't care what age you are. You can always, you can always learn more. Mate, when, when we're younger, I feel like we judge our parents so harshly yeah. until it's time for us to be that age yes. and, to, and to live that life. And all of a sudden you see it through those different eyes and you realize, shit, I forgive you for a lot of this now. Yeah. Um, and I understand how just how hard it is. My, my mom died when I was younger. And I almost feel like now as I'm older, I'm getting to know her still and understanding her on a totally different level almost is like her equal now. Yeah. I'm like, oh, so this is why, oh, okay, I get it. And um, it is a phenomenal thing that we have to go through. And I was just sort of wondering if when you go to sleep at night, do you have a dream about the old days? Is that sort of replaying sometimes or are you completely clear of it? Right. I got to tell you this. My wife shocked me the other day because I fight a lot in my sleep. Oh, now, I don't know this, yeah. but the other day, she was so moved by it. She took a video of me and I was actually really fighting. I was angry. I was this. Again, I, maybe the demons come out yep. during that time. I don't ever remember anything really, but mm. it happens a lot. And she said, I said, come on, it can't be like that. But she showed it to me and I was like, it was scary for yeah. a minute. It was like uh, something possessed me. Mm-hmm. I'm, not, I'm not kidding. And I said, wow, uh, I don't know. Maybe that's when it comes out. Yeah, I guess maybe that's kind of like going back to the Jordan Peterson thing of like, you know, is it really the other side of you or is it just yeah. tucked away somewhere? And maybe when your unconscious, you know, is allowed to come out at night, maybe it's rearing its head a little bit. Yes, yes. Uh, we're going to have to get your wife a baseball bat or something <laughs> just in case. I know sometimes she'll shove me. I said, what are you doing? She says, do you realize what you're doing? I said, of course not. I'm sleeping. <laughs> I've got, I like to end the interview with a, a few sort of general questions just to see what they bring out of each guest because I think that it's sort of interesting. So of all the time you, you know, you spent on this planet, what's the hardest thing you feel like you've been through? Believe it or not, one of the toughest things, one of the things I'm, I'm very angry about what's going on in my country, my youngest daughter, I have five daughters, two boys. My youngest daughter was very much in love with a young man 24 years old and they were going to get engaged and he was actually my videographer. You know, he was doing all my video work, very talented in that regard. And, uh, an athlete, six foot two, good looking guy, wonderful disposition, just a wonderful young man. Well, I'm speaking in Chicago. He was initially from Michigan. So he was living in my house in, in, uh, California. We had a guest room. And I'm on my way to the airport and I have ring on my phone where I don't know if you have that here. The Mm -hmm. video comes up and it's six in the morning back in LA and ring comes on. The door of my house is open and police are walking in and out of my house. I'm like, what the heck? You know, what's going on? All these things went through my head. Then I see the paramedics. So now my wife and daughter are home. What happened? I'm I'm going crazy. I'm trying to call. Nobody's answering. Make a very long story short, this young man took an Adderall, Adderall, that these kids do. They try to stay up to do their tests in college, right, that was laced with fentanyl. Within 10 minutes, 
collapsed on my bathroom floor and died. Oh my. He was poisoned. He wasn't an addict. He was poisoned, right? So my daughter was so traumatized, uh, Brian, that for six months we couldn't go back in the house. I thought I was going to have to move. It took her, it's only the last three months. This happened a little over two years ago that she's come out of it. But to see what this young girl went through, my daughter that I love, you know, she's my only child out of seven that I was with since birth. No interruption with prison. So we're very tight. Mm -hmm. And my wife found him too. So the two of these women, the two women in my life were traumatized. To watch her go through this was probably the most difficult thing out of everything that I've experienced. And we're talking a lot that, that I had to go through and that we had to go through as a family. And it's, it's got me so angry because I know what's going happen, coming down on our southern border, all the drugs that are coming through, 100,000 people a year dying, being, half of them being poisoned, not even addicts, with this stuff that's coming through. So I, I think that's the most, and I, I'm, I'm being honest with you, I'm so angry about it right now that I have to pray to subs my, make my anger subside because you don't want it, your anger to get the best of you. Uh -huh. You make wrong decisions. But it's something that's uh, even harder than being in a hole. I hear that. Like, I really feel like that pain. And uh, I think it says a lot about you that my question of what's the hardest thing you've been through was watching someone else's pain yeah. and not your own. So, you know, I respect that you have a lot of empathy for your daughter. And, uh, you know, I hope that she can get through um, what is going to be probably, you know, a few more years of dealing with this to come to terms with it because a death like that it it, it is a, a, a sudden death so I've, I've known them and they're very hard to, to deal with you know especially your daughter being so young so much for her to go through and uh, yeah I mean yeah, that is so difficult it was, man. it's tough mm. and fortunately for the last three months she's starting to this was the in other words she's been okay for a week and then boom goes back into depression but these last three months she's been like for two years we couldn't celebrate christmas we didn't have a christmas because it was just too hard for her we understood to watch you someone you love go through that pain it's oh gosh it was it was torture and, and, and they say it and it is true like time is that healer that that people like need and um you just, you just, uh, I'm assuming that you're getting a counseling and that sort of stuff to try and help her through Therapy, it. Therapy, our church was terrific. And I got to tell you this, Brian, do you love animals? I certainly do. Okay. Man. Yeah. She, we have this uh, Siberian Husky. I fell in love with this dog. <laughs> like you have, she's a wonderful dog, but mm -hmm. what she's done for my daughter. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's like, she's been a breath of fresh air in the house. Mm -hmm. And my, my daughter actually travels with us. Mm -hmm. She's not with us now because she didn't want to leave the dog <laughs> because we're coming back for the tour and yeah. we have other things planned. So she didn't want to spend that much time away from yeah. our little Nova. So I always enjoyed animals and loved animals, but now it's like, this is like a child in our house. She's been so, uh, so well appreciated. I was just saying this recently in the last week to someone like they animals, but dogs, especially they're like they like batteries they literally charge everyone up with yes. love that they touch it's unbelievable what they can do like what's your biggest regret up till now i have a few but you know i have a couple um i was married early on before mm -hmm. i met my wife for a short period of time i had three children with her good woman nothing negative to say but one of my biggest regrets was not being as close with mainly my two daughters i had two daughters and a son my son is out with me. He's been with me for 15 years. Uh, but my two girls, I never was able to solidify that relationship. Number one, because I divorced their mom and we were separated. And with my, I didn't only leave them. I left them because I went right to jail. Mm -hmm. So I was like really gone out of their lives and was never able to repair it to the point that I should. Mm -hmm. And I take the blame for that. It's my responsibility as a father. Maybe I didn't do everything I should have done. I don't know. But that's a deep regret. Um, and the other regret is, you know, not as a person of faith, we're supposed to share our faith with the people that we love. I didn't do that to the right extent with my dad. I feel that I could have done more. And it was just very hard for me to communicate with him on that basis. 
that's not an excuse. I should have still worked it harder, Mm -hmm. but I didn't. And that's a regret because, you know, as a Christian, we believe in heaven and hell. And, you know, hopefully my dad is where he's in heaven and he made his, uh, his, uh, you know, his peace with the Lord. But if that didn't happen, am I somewhat responsible because I didn't do enough, you know? So it's something that's going to stay with me until I find out, Mm -hmm. you know, put it that way. Who was it that inspired you the most in your life? Well, early on, it was my dad. I have mm. to say that. And it's been my wife. I mean, absolutely. she, yeah, absolutely my wife. She's, not only has she inspired me, she's kept me on the right track. Mm-hmm. I'm not perfect. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I, she, she has, she has a work cut out for me <laughs> with me. Let me tell you, I'm not the easiest guy to keep on track all the time. And I've made mistakes in my life. You know, mm. look, marriage is difficult when everything is great. But when you have the pressure that we had, eight years in prison and all this kind of stuff, the mob mentality, um, it's even more difficult. But, you know, we were totally committed to one another. And here we are 38 years later through all of these conditions. But she has uh, <clears throat> inspired me to be a better person and to to do the right things. And she's kept me on track for the most part. Eight years. What's your tip uh, if, you, if you had to give one in terms of, as a man, you know, uh, being a good husband? Well, you know, they say happy, li- happy wife, <laughs> <laughs> happy life. You know, again, it's, look, no matter what nonsense may be, my wife knows that I love her very much. Mm-hmm. I, in many ways, put her on a pedestal because she's earned that. She deserves that. Mm-hmm. And I enjoy treating her that way, you know? And in turn, she gives me everything that I need. You know, she's very compliant in that. So and maybe that's the wrong word. I don't want to, you know, she's, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> people, yeah, yeah, I got to choose. You may fold under questioning. Exactly. <laughs> she, uh, you know, she does the right thing. With, yeah. You know, so we complement each other well. Um, yeah, man. And we're opposite in a lot of ways. Okay. She's, I got to say this, she's a better judge of character than I am. Yeah. You know, and with my wife, you don't have too many, she'll always love you, she'll pray for you, but if she thinks you're not the right person, you're going to have to ver- work very, very hard to get back into mm-hmm. her graces because she's very intuitive that way. I tend to be easy, mm-hmm. you know, and she'll tell me, you're making a mistake then. No, oh, don't worry about it. And she's right. She'd most have made a better mob boss than you. She might. <laughs> <laughs> she might have. But, but uh, and she's very protective of me also. You know, she watches uh, this and I appreciate that. Well, yeah, I mean, because now you're a man of value. You're, you're, you're literally able to help all these people, which means people want to be helped. Yes. So I'm assuming she's got her eyes peeled and uh, that's a healthy thing because kind of like what we were saying about the conciliary role that like you were saying earlier is you don't want a conciliary who's a yes man who's going to be the same as you. And a relationship it's a lot like having you're both conciliary for each other I guess like that sort of absolutely and fitting in where each other are weaker makes for a better scenario in my opinion than two people who are identical um, and in terms of your life who do you feel was the one that let you down the most um, I think it was my dad you know in the end and I don't, I don't want it like it's I'm not complaining about it but it was disappointing to me the way in both of those areas. Number one, you know, what happened that night, I felt it was a betrayal. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And number two, not taking responsibility. And, and another thing, you know, after my dad was um, was violated for the third time, mm-hmm. you know, and the family's falling apart. <clears throat> Excuse me. I said to him, Dad, our family is falling apart. You need to get out of New York. Let's go to Florida, California, whatever. And... Put the family back together. Forget everything else. Prioritize the family. Yes. He wouldn't do that. And as a result, the family's destroyed. And I, initially, I didn't hold that against him. But later on, I said, he could have made it. Di- he could have walked away. My dad earned it. Hey, you know what? I got to worry about my family. I'm on parole. I can't associate with anybody. And nobody would have held it against him. Exactly. Because of who he was, his position. Yeah. But he chose to, his his bigger allegiance was to that life. The problem my dad had, his legacy meant everything in the life. Not as a husband and a father. Reputation his, over reality. Exactly. And when I realized that that was wrong, it was very disappointing. Yeah. And I he, he should have been a different man in that regard. 
Yeah. And I always relate things that people tell me to my own life. And that is that reputation over reality thing is definitely something I've been aware of lately. Like, cause when everyone starts knowing who you are, whatever the reason is, it can go to your head and it can become the number one focus. And it, it's such a mistake. It's an easy trap to fall into that many men, especially because we have egos, right? We want everyone to know how great we are. Of course. How, why else would I be sitting in front of a camera? Um, but you know, I have to, uh, being a better man is always the most important thing to me now. And I'm glad I've sort of in my thirties managed to figure that out, uh, because I've seen some men, as you've described there, kind of, it's too late yeah. to put it right. And that's such an oh, important absolutely. thing. And I know young men watch the show. And if they are listening, like if you aren't happy with your, who the real person is, definitely is you've got to figure that out quicker than what people think of you for sure. Yeah. And you know, Brian, I have, uh, I visit prisons quite a bit and you know, kind of minister to men in there. <clears throat> and this is what I tell young men. I can't tell you how many guys, 50s, you know, late 40s, 50s, early 60s, and they turn around, they'll say to me, Michael, look at my life. Mm -hmm. You know, what did I do? I wasted all these years, all this time. I don't have a wife now. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm spending my time in prison, you know, and, and they don't realize what they're doing to themselves, mm -hmm. you know, until reality really hits yeah. and it hits hard. And that's why I tell these young men, listen, you're only young once. Do the right thing and young so that when you get old, you're set up properly yep. for your older years. And, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of young guys may, oh, I have time. I have time. No, you don't have time. Do it now. Get yourself in shape now in the right way. Um, Do you know, what, you know when that hit me when I turned 35? Because my whole life I thought, by 35, I'll have it all figured out. Yeah. And when I turned 35, I thought... I need to make some big changes here. Yeah. The clock is ticking. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but see, there again, you know, that's when you need guidance, you need mentorship, you need mm -hmm. people ex telling you things. You know, one of, one of the things that I attribute to some of the success I had is I was always a good listener. I paid attention to people. And even now, if somebody like I'll sit there and wow, if somebody has something smart to tell me, I want to pay attention. I don't know everything. You know, I can learn. And, uh, and, and being a good listener, when people told me to do things that were smart, I tried to pay attention to that. And it pays off in the mm. end. There's no question. Well, my last question, mate, um, and this has been fantastic, by the way. One last yes. question. How would you like to be remembered? My legacy, um, a good husband, a good father to my children, grandfather to my, uh, to my uh, grandchildren, and just that, you know, he, he did benefit the community and the people around him. And basically, that's what you want to be. If you can be known as that or known for that, you've, you've lived your life okay. Well, that was amazing. I've thoroughly enjoyed this one. One of my favorites. Uh, this was Michael Francis on the True Geordie podcast. You can catch his to uh, He's coming to the UK. You can watch his YouTube channel. You can buy the books. I'll put all the links in the description below. Thank you very much, Michael. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Brian. And I have to say this. This was, you, you got things out of me that I haven't spoken about before, and I really appreciate that. And I have a lot more to talk about on the tour, but mm -hmm. I just want to thank all the people of the United Kingdom. I, I mean, I've been more accepted here than anywhere in the world. No. And people are always nice and gracious, but to a greater extent here. Mm -hmm. um, and I really appreciate that. And you guys have won me over. So Amazing, amazing. We'll keep coming back. Uh, don't forget, you can check out the two other links in the description below. If you haven't already, hit that like button. Subscribe to the True Geordie YouTube channel. Thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one. Thank you very much, Michael. Brian, that was great. Loved it. I really mean it. Uh, good job. You know, thank you. thank you very much. <laughs>